got to go into it. Hey, everybody, this is uh, Frankie Slauson, and welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show here on KTEC, KTEQ, and also broadcasting on YouTube uh, on, the, on my Frankie Slauson Show page as well. Uh, another interview uh, for the year of 2014, my second interview of uh, this year. Uh, as you guys know, uh, lately we've been uh, airing a show called Into the Music, and it's mostly been airing during my show, the Frankie Slauson Show, on Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. And uh, today I have with me the host and the producer and the man pretty much behind the whole Into the Music concept, Mr. Al Neff. How's it going, Al? Hey, Frankie, I'm doing pretty good. I'm uh, coming to you, actually. Uh, we'll, we'll spoil the illusion here for your listeners. Uh, we're speaking to one another. I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota, where we got, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe five, six inches of snow on top of what we already had. And uh, it's bitterly cold here almost all the time. Yeah, and here I am in Rapid City, <laughs> South Dakota. And uh, the weather here is, well, it's it's kind of cold, but it's nothing like what you guys got in Minnesota. Right. Now, for the last uh, about 12 years, I've lived in Denver, Colorado, and that's when Into the Music, as people hear it, that's when almost all of those shows were produced. And uh, I love Denver, and I think I might have made a really strange decision to move back here to my home state, but uh, which is your home state as well, right? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, I, I, a lot of people know <laughs> that I grew up in northern Minnesota, because I keep telling them that during my show and stuff, and it's just, maybe just because I'm a little homesick, but... I don't know. It just it's uh, Minnesota was nice. I lived there uh, 29 years of my life, and then uh, pretty much just uh, needed a change. And uh, I have family here in, in Rapid City, so it was perfect opportunity to move. And uh, so far, things are going pretty good. Yeah, Rapid City's a nice little town, and uh, you know, and Minnesota is great. I want to clarify. I love Minnesota, but the weather is different, and it's a challenge. I forgot what it's like, and sure enough first winter back after being gone for years this is a real minnesota winter this is no joke yeah yeah i, I think i remember like back in the day before ever you know people ever started talking about global warming and uh kind of just uh, remembered how when i was a kid you know, growing up like in the late 80s early 90s uh how the winters were yeah we had some bad winters and then uh, all of a sudden then the weather got kind of not so normal where I think because of the El Nino temperatures or something like that, uh, sometimes during Christmas time we would not even have any snow, and then all of a sudden we'd have snow. <laughs> yeah, well, we got plenty of snow right now. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably uh, we'll let the weathermen talk about the weather. Uh, let's talk about music, or, uh, well, you can read the discussion. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, since I am uh, interviewing you for the very first time, I want to first of all say how it's a pleasure to be able to, to talk to you. I I will tell you how I found you in the first place because uh, you might. You, I think you kind of know a little bit, but I'm going to kind of explain kind of a backstory before we get into more about uh, what we're talking about here today. Uh, I discovered you back around probably 2005 or 2006 when I was volunteering at, at a well-known station called Pioneer 90.1 KSRQ in Thiefer Falls, Minnesota, and uh, I would hear your your shows and. Uh, uh, I think it was either Tra I think Travis Ryder was the one that got uh, that maybe discovered you as far as uh, what we were trying to do for uh, for new pr new content uh, for the radio station and uh, because we didn't have much Minnesota based content at the time and uh, so we were uh, I got introduced to your show uh, at that point in time and I, I always enjoyed it and I just uh, you know was always curious to how you know it got started and, and how you know the idea came about. And then I, you know, when I moved here to Rapid City, uh, I was trying to tell my station manager at the time, uh, Brock, I was telling him that, you know, if we're going to be going live in Rapid City pretty soon, because we're, right now we're only available uh, online on ktech.org, uh, pretty soon we will be broadcasting live in Rapid City uh, as soon as uh, we get uh, the, t uh, the tower up and everything that we need to do. But uh, I wanted to uh, find what we could do for content for the, for the station. And I just I thought you know there was a show that we used to, that still is airing on Pioneer Night for One that uh, a guy named Al Neff who does a show called Into the Music and uh, it's an hour long show based on uh, what it is it's mostly a uh, audio documentary or biography in a way of an artist and uh, I thought you know that's a pretty neat concept so that's why I wanted to uh, air your show on our radio station so that's how I found you. 
from you, and uh, Hugh has carried into the music, I believe, for nine years now. Yeah. Like, even ten years. Uh, Travis Ryder was the program director at that time, and I met him through the Ampers Radio Network in, in Minnesota. Um, so I was just beginning to syndication process at that time. You know, I had produced the show for a station called KVSC in St. Cloud, Minnesota. That's where it was born. But I only did it for that one station for uh, quite a number of years, and really just, you know, part-time, just for fun. But I got a good enough response to it that I I thought that it, it, it should be heard by more people. And it kind of came to a point where I guess I feel that it's one of my life's destinies is, is to tell the story of popular music to the level I can with, uh, uh, for my generation and the type of style that I have. You know, someday I would like to hear the Into the Music of uh, Tupac, but I'm probably not the guy to tell the story. <laughs> Very comfortable telling the story of the Allman Brothers or the Doors or um, all the way back to do news. We have Muddy Waters coming up this, uh, this week. And I was raised on classic country, so I have shows on Hank Williams and Johnny Cash. But primarily because of my life experience and personal tastes, I guess at the core of the show could be considered classic rock. Um, let me tell you a fun story I think that you and, and your listeners will enjoy about how the program got started. Well, back in 1982, I believe, a long time ago, I got busted for drinking while I was on the air. Oh, boy. <laughs> yep, yep. At KVSC. Or nineteen or something, and uh, and I, you know, really, I wasn't being such a bad boy. My girlfriend at the time I had, was at a party, place and they had bottles of champagne, and she was just kind of a feisty little gal, and uh, you know, took a bottle of champagne and brought it to the radio station with a couple of plastic glasses. So I'm sitting there having a little glass of champagne with my girlfriend while I was on the air. But obviously, that's not the right thing to do. And the security guard came by, and it's a no-alcohol campus, so he had to write me up, and then they suspended me. The station manager suspended me for a month or six weeks or something like that. And uh, I, was, I was okay with that. I understood his position. He had to do something. But I said, uh, would it be okay if I did a recorded program? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? You know. So basically, I just started doing these shows where I... You know, hit play and record on the reel to reel, and I'd have a, a bunch of notes on in my notebook, and I'd have my records set up on the turntables, and I'd just kind of put together a show that resembled Into the Music, but pretty much did it live. It was very crude in its presentation compared to what I do now, but, you know, I just started putting that together. People liked it, and as time went on, I got better and better at it. Uh, and what started as the inside story, it was called back then, eventually mutated into... Uh, the show into the music that you know today. So it goes back a long ways, and, and I'm hoping right now there's 223 completely produced hours in the library. I'm hoping to uh, double that within the next 10 years or so. And, and you know, I, and I think you'll be able to do it just fine because, you know, it's like it, it's, it's become part of your life. And, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a pretty interesting story, uh, the, the fact that because uh, we were just discussing about uh, at the station about some of the rules and some of the things you can uh, you can and cannot do uh, uh, while being on the air. And yes, and drinking, of course. Uh, yeah, 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 you, you should do it on the air. You, you shouldn't even do it on television. And sometimes people can get, get away with it somehow. <laughs> You used to be though. You're a you're a big pop culture fan. You used to be. If you ever watch those Dean Martin roasts that they have, yep. uh, and you can get them now. They're through Time Life. You can get the whole. Thing. But those guys were smashed on TV every time. <laughs> and, but, <laughs> but half the time, you know, even though they were smashed, they were still perfect. I mean, you could. I mean, you could tell they probably were, but they they're so professional and stuff. They're so good at what they're making jokes and stuff and all that. So. Oh, it was a very entertaining show. I loved it. And I watched it with my parents. Everybody was on board. But, of course, uh, for you and all your colleagues out there at K-Tech, you know, you don't want to follow my footsteps that way. But that was the, you know, the catalyst, I guess. I think it was, uh, you know, designed to be that way. That's, that's how it all got started. I put a little energy into it and you know, picked it up and left it behind. Did it, so, you know, just once in a while. But, but after a while, I kind of said to myself, you know, this is what I really like to do. I think I'm really good at this, and I think this is what I'm meant to do. So sometimes your direction in life will come at a strange moment. And, and you know, and 
that's just the thing. And, and for people who uh, who are just uh, tuning in right now, we're talking to Al Neff, the host of the Into the Music series that we uh, air right here on KTech, and we've been airing it for the last uh, at least couple months or so, at least. And uh, you know, it, it's just amazing. If you guys go to Into the Music dot I believe it's dot com, right? Into music dot com. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just triple, it's been a while. triple W into the music dot com. That's and, the website. And, uh, uh, can people access the uh, like the t- the artist list without being a member, or no? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's completely open. The only thing they can't access, and I and I do have a lot of listeners that go there hoping that they can download or stream past programs. So uh, you, you can do that, unfortunately. I'll tell you why in just a moment. But you can go to the schedule and see what we have programmed ahead. Uh, you just look about a month ahead. Uh, so for this coming month, uh, February, uh, it's Black History Month. So it's all African this spring with Muddy Waters, a, a two-part feature on Muddy Waters, who was just so fundamentally influential on uh, on blues and then later into rock. Let's say without Muddy Waters, there's no way that Jimi Hendrix would have ever happened. Oh, wow. uh, and for that matter, the Rolling Stones, the, the name the Rolling Stones comes from uh, a song that was sometimes called Rolling Stone, sometimes called Catfish Blues, Muddy Waters song. That's uh, the main reason that the magazine Rolling Stone has its name. Waters is tied into the you know the, the trunk of the tree that branched out and became rock and roll. So anyway, you could uh, find out about the shows that are coming up. Uh, you could go to the archives and see all of the shows that we've covered. But because of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was passed in 1996, just when the digital revolution uh, started to threaten the interests of the music industry, uh, because of that, there was legislation passed through Congress that says that you cannot digitally transmit more than three songs for the same artist in a two-hour period of time. Uh, so that knocked out the, the musical period as far as being able to allow a podcast or downloading or streaming, and, and I can't sell it to you because I don't own the rights to the music. Okay. So that's been, a, that's been a big obstacle to try to overcome, but we are working on ways, and I'm confident that uh, sometime within the next year or so that there will be ways for listeners to access the entire library in a different method of delivery oh sure and you know and i think that's i, I, I think that's kind of neat though it's just uh uh that you know we talk about pop culture and uh, you know i know you know i don't know everything about pop culture but i do know a lot more than the average 30 year old i would say i think it's just uh do, do you ever impress the people or are people impressed by the fact that you know so much about musical history or is this just something that just comes natural to you well, both. It comes naturally to me. Um, my mind just works that way. And when I was young, when I was growing up, uh, my dad was in the oil field, and so I spent a lot of time in places like Warland, Wyoming, and Casper, Wyoming, and uh, Mile City, Montana, Plentywood, Montana, Williston, North Dakota, you know, oil field towns. There wasn't a whole lot to do. So for me, listening to the radio was my escape from what surrounded me in the trailer courts where we lived. Uh, we moved just about every year, um, but I could always pick up these radio stations. And, you know, so I learned a lot about music and learned to love music and love the presentation of the DJs and the whole mystery of being able, late at night on AM radio, to get that skip and be able to Chicago or Denver or Oklahoma City or Kansas City or Cleveland, you know? It was just like a completely magical thing. So, you know, I started to soak that stuff in. I became sort of obsessed with it, as kids do with their favorite thing. We were going on for quite a long time. And then, you know, as I entered my adulthood, I ended up getting a master's degree in popular culture. So I have a fairly advanced education in things that relate to radio, television, film, advertising, and especially music. So what that adds up to is, yes, people are impressed by how much I know of music history and music trivia, um, but they're also impressed by the fact that I can't play an instrument, I can't sing, I'm not a, really a very good dancer. <laughs> you know, really what I do is I'm a, I'm a historian and a biographer. Oh, and, and you know, and that's cool. That, that, that's, that's, uh, the world needs more people like, like you and the world, you know, because it just... Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, and, and I think this is very true, you know, you grew up in a time where, 
you know, music was just, you know, evolving one one band at a time and one decade at a time. Uh, what do you think our young people of today are missing from uh, from the stuff that uh, that you grew up on back in the day? Well, you know, in, in some ways it's always been the same. Uh, like the Beatles, in a certain sense, were a boy band in 1964, 63, when they were first coming up. They were good-looking young guys, and they were fun, and all the girls liked them. And, you know, they did uh, simple little songs that were easy to dance to and hum along with, uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, stuff like that. And then as time went on, you know, the societal situation changed, and the people changed. The Beatles changed and matured, and their audience matured and so but you get to the end of their career doing very sophisticated compositions and music that has stood the test of time. I don't know what's gonna happen with Justin Bieber. You know, things aren't looking real good at the moment, but he's gonna grow up like everybody has to and his fans will sure and you just never can tell what uh what Justin Bieber is going to do five or ten years from now. And we've seen, let's say, Justin Timberlake, and he'd take it a part of a generation back. You know, he's doing some pretty sophisticated things musically and otherwise uh, as he's developed as a person. But I will say that when I listen to new music, like let's say if I go to my health club and they've got a lot of the current, you know, young rotation going, uh, auto-tune really bothers me. Uh, not just because of the way it sounds, but because it's auto-tune. You know, it almost means that you don't have to sing anymore. And what they're looking for, what their market is, attractive, physically attractive young person, uh, almost regardless of real talent. And so the position of the song these days are pro rather than played. And, you know, it's the changing face of society as reflected through the music, as it always is. We're a more computer-driven society these days, but I miss the days of musicianship and uh, lyrics that have meaning and tell a story and people that have true expressive talent. Yes, yes, and I I, I agree with you on that because uh, nowadays, you know, even like even a lot of country music nowadays is really going more poppy than anything else. It it still sounds the same, but it's not, I don't know, to me it's not as good as the the, the classic country and the stuff from like the 70s, 80s, 90s, and whatever. Even the 2000s had some, some good uh, country music as well. But nowadays, I don't think it's, it's nearly as good as it, as it used to be. Well, you know, but it's, it's tempting for everyone to say that uh, 30 or 20 or 10 years ago, when you grew up, those were the good old days. And there's a certain kind of like a psychological effect of the music that strikes you when you're in your teens, especially in your young adults. So that's the music that tends to stick with you as your favorites through life. Um, so same as it always was. Uh, but I do feel that the industry has changed and not necessarily for the betterment of the artist or the artistry. We'll see how it all unfolds. We're going to hear a lot of great music that hasn't been made yet. But I do agree with you fundamentally that a lot of the classic music that will stand the test of time has already been made, and that much of what's being made today is somewhat more disposable. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's just all a matter of change, I guess. You know, we just like you said, you know, things change through time, and music will always change from one thing to another. Uh, a lot of people are saying, like, the days of rock and roll are, are slowly dying. Do you believe that's true, or do you believe rock and roll has yet to evolve? Well, if you're talking about the rock and roll people, it kind of depends on whether you're talking about Mick Jagger, who is now in his 70s, and he's taking great care of himself, but, I mean, he's just getting up there. And uh, some of those guys, well, yeah, they're going to they're gonna die. Uh, they're going to be physically, and they won't be able to do what they did in their youth, and then uh, some have already passed on. That's just the human life cycle. But in terms of uh, rock and roll itself, well, I don't know. I went to see a concert. I went to see uh, Bob Dylan last summer with uh, Wilco, uh, one of my favorite bands that are somewhat on the younger side, although they're seasoned veterans now. And then My Morning Jacket was the opener. And of the three of them, I enjoyed all of them. But My Morning Jacket blew my mind. Uh, I thought they were a bit more of like a, a folkier group from what I had heard, but they rocked. It was great. I got Jim James as my favorite new rock star. And there's, you know, there's others out there, too. He's just the one that comes to my mind right now. I think that there's some fantastic rock and roll being made. And 
I'm going to also point to like my two retro favorites that are big deals, uh, Jack White, who also has been around for over 10 years now, but just about anything Jack White is involved with I'm interested in, and the Black Keys. Uh, bring back, you know, Muddy Waters, when he listens, if he was able to hear the Black Keys, he'd be smiling, because a lot of what Muddy Waters did has found its way into the Black Keys, and I see 20-year-olds out there on the dance floor to that stuff, so God bless America. Oh, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of a good way to look at it, though. I mean, yeah, I mean that's uh, that's why I I try to ask those questions, and you give me the you give me the answers when it comes to that. That's uh, that's a pretty good uh, statement, anyway. Uh, I also want to say uh, I want to back up and say one of the really good things that's happening in music right now is that young women like Taylor Swift and Lord. Um, they have a big place in today's music, and sadly, if you take a look through the history of music, it's really uh, startling how male-dominated it is. And you might think, oh, well, it's always kind of been that way in, let's say, old-time country or something. You had Patsy Cline, and then later you had Tammy Wynette and Loretta Lynn, but there's not very many by comparison. Or in the blues, you had uh, Coco Taylor or, or, or um, Etta James, you know, but that's really the only two really big ones. But even in classic rock, once you get past heart, the Wilson sisters, and then the uh, women that are in Fleetwood Mac, but they didn't call most of the shots. They wrote some of the songs, but Christine would be in CD Mix. And then, of course, you have Janis Joplin, and you might include Aretha Franklin, although she's not really rock. Uh, then you might go ahead and throw in Pat Benatar. But you get past that small club, and it's, it thins out pretty fast. Uh, there's others. I could say Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane, and I might include uh, Joni Mitchell or someone like that. But 95% of the music of classic rock was made by men. And that's not really fair. So now the profile is today that there's a lot of young women that are getting a chance to participate. And I think that that's a great thing that's happening in music. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I believe so too. I mean, that's, you're right. A lot of, lot more men in the industry than women, uh, which is, you know, kind of sad on some parts because there are a lot of talented women out there that are artists. Uh, I, I have a, like three more questions I want to ask you before we end this interview. Uh, one has to do on, on a festival, and, and the festival I'm talking about is Woodstock. And uh, do you think, I mean, there, yes, there are a lot of festivals out there now, but do you think there'll be another ever another festival as big as Woodstock was or that will have uh, the same impact like Woodstock did? Well, uh, I don't know if you, you probably are not aware of it, but I've uh, uh, I've extracted the schedule for this year out a ways, and I'm going to rerun the uh, two-hour Into the Music feature on Woodstock this August, so you'll be able to hear that program if you haven't. I'm, I'm really proud of that one. It was a really special event. As far as a concert that big, if you mean numerically the number of people, they think, they don't really know exactly, but about a half million people were at that festival. And they have festivals today, mostly in Europe, that verge on that size. But as far as the dynamic of people coming together and everybody getting along, despite the lack of security and, uh, you know, that cooperative spirit that happened at uh, the original Woodstock, I don't think so. You know, that was a product of its time, and we don't live in those times. And, you know, you might say, and I might agree, that that's kind of a sad thing. I went to the last big festival of that kind here in the United States, which was Woodstock 99. And uh, they, you know, found a site that was fairly close to the original Woodstock. It was the 30th anniversary. The original happened in 1969. And I will have to say that it was a disturbing event. Not to say I didn't have some fun there, but uh, it's amazing the devastation that can be caused by 400,000 people that abuse drugs and alcohol. Okay. So that was uh, after the in the aftermath of that festival, which had so many problems, the organizers decided that they would not try to replicate again the Woodstock experience. It just seems like it's a little too dangerous these days. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think you're right too on that point because uh, that's why I was just kind of wondering uh, to try to get your opinion on that because uh, well, t- I just uh, recently watched. I, I I've known about Woodstock for most of my life. But I just recently purchased the Blu-ray of it, and, and the quality and the audio and all that, and the picture, oh, it's just amazing. It's almost like you're, it's almost like you're there, almost like. 
Absolutely. The uh, the filmmakers, uh, they just did a magnificent job, and uh, most people uh, in my audience have seen that, but maybe some of yours haven't. Younger people, they split the screen, so there's almost always two images or sometimes more to watch. So you can watch that film again and again and see different things. And then when you're able to actually witness uh, in that film, you know, what a gorgeous human being uh, Jimi Hendrix was when he played guitar. Uh, it's just something like you, you don't know that it can be that good. And it's not just Jimi Hendrix. There's lots and lots of great performances. The Sly and the Family Stone is another high point. But anyway, I recommend, and I think you would, that if you haven't seen the Woodstock film, you should see it. And even if you have seen it, you should get the the advanced, uh, you know, versions, the enhanced uh, audio and and uh, video quality. And you won't be sorry that you spent that twenty bucks. Oh, exactly. Uh, I uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it's definitely it's definitely worth the the buy. It's for any true fan or collector of that uh, that time or that uh, genre or, or era in time. Yes, I I definitely would agree on that one. Uh, just recently, and I think I don't know if you currently are still doing this or not, but uh, you do, you've been doing a GoFundMe campaign. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we uh, there were some delays in getting it started. Uh, we originally were going to do it on Kickstarter, which is the big crowdsource funding organization out there, but they have certain specifications that just didn't fit with with the program. Um, so we switched over to GoFundMe. It caused a bit of a delay, and by the time we kicked it off, we were already in the holiday season. So we had some level of success uh, for, let's say, between uh, Thanksgiving and maybe the week or so before Christmas. But then, you know, people were taking care of holiday matters, and their, you know, discretionary money was tied up in Christmas presents, and that's only appropriate. So we took some time off. We just fired it back up again this week. Um, so I don't know exactly when this will be broadcast, but the third week in January, we basically uh, brought it back up. And we're going to keep it going for around another six weeks because we have a new opportunity uh, for the show, and that is that there is a station out here in Minnesota, uh, WXYG, which has agreed to carry the program, to carry into the music on a nightly basis rather than a weekly basis. And the library is now big enough that it can accommodate that. Um, if we take a, sort of uh, a wide scope, what is appropriate to their format, which is a deep track classic rock format, we have about 180 hours that would be appropriate for this station. The GOAT, it's called. You can Google the GOAT. And uh, so that means that even playing it every it's Monday through Saturday, not on Tuesdays, but Monday through Saturday. That will mean that it was still only played twelve a year. It's kind of incredible when I think about it that I've assembled a library that is that large. The good news is, though, this is that first step toward more accessibility of the listeners. Uh, if you like into the music, you can now listen to it every single night of the week, Monday through Saturday on the GOAT, and then a few stations carry it on nights. And then, of course, uh, KTAC on Wednesday mornings. But uh, it's much more access to those programs by the listeners, and it means you'll even be able to make a request, and I should be able to put that show on within a, a week or two um, if it hasn't been played any time real recently. So it's the first step that we're being able to take that will get more exposure to the show, uh, and that's what we ultimately want to do is provide on-demand access, but this is a step that direction. And, and, I, and I think that's neat because uh, what what uh, what you the listeners should should realize, you know, you know, the reason why Al also is doing this is because of the fact that, you know, th this it takes it takes money to, you know, it's a lot of production hours, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of research, a lot of production hours, a lot of you know idea gathering, and uh, you know to to make a, a show or an episode uh, even exist and. Uh, do you want to kind of explain what uh, you're going to do with some of the money that you uh, receive? Well, I'm going to simply survive <laughs> and uh, maybe buy a new computer because the computer that I use, I don't exactly trust it anymore. It's It's been a good computer. It's a workhorse for me. Uh, I think it'll... Um, pop reference. So equipment upgrades and then just being able to survive because it's the, the thing is the time to, to convert the library from weekly to daily and then to continue to expand the library is a very time-consuming matter that doesn't have any instant financial payback. And it takes about 30 to 40 hours if you add up the research 
the writing, which is very time consuming. Uh, the revisions on that writing before opening the mic, you know, then it's the voicing, then it's the production, and then it's the uh, duplication or distribution, depending on how we get the show to the stations. So, you know, 40 hours a full work week for every hour that you hear. Uh, it's a huge time investment. So if people can help out with anything that they would be comfortable in donating, it could be $10, you know, that's fine. I just kind of want to build the list and have that support. The amount is is less important. But if you contribute, I think uh, the first category is at 33. There's reference to 33 and third yeah. rotations per minute. That's the speed of an album. <laughs> and uh, then you get little perks like uh, you get it into the music Frisbee that looks like an album little mini frisbee, and then we got coffee cups and, you know, little things like that. But, uh, you know, we just hope that people support the show because they enjoy the show, and I really hope that they use it as a tool to spread the love of an artist or a group out, you know, to the, it might be their brother, it might be their kids, it might be their their best friend, but uh, I actually kind of encourage to record it from the radio and give that to some, this is why love the Moody Blues, or, you know, whoever it is. I, I hope it's a tool that people can use to share their love of music. And, and that, uh, that definitely uh, is uh, uh, exciting to, to hear about because, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we want to do our best to keep this show going because it's, uh, you know, it's been a, a, a long journey for you, It's a, but you've been very dedicated to it. And, and that's just the thing. A lot of people who, uh, you know, eventually... You know, as things change, as we were talking about, sometimes things things come to an end, and I would hate to see uh, the Into the Music series ever really end. I mean, sure, it'll end at one point, at some time, but I would really hate to see it end, especially now, when you, when I'm sure you have gathered a lot of different ideas, and you, and there's still a lot of artists you want to cover. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I'll kind of throw this in there that uh, if people, you know, will be donation to GoFundMe campaign, I, they would welcome their request. Uh, I would welcome any request, but, you know, especially for people that actively support the show, I'll do my best to put it on the list and produce that show if it doesn't already exist. Or if it does, I'll do my best to get it on the air at a time that is convenient for the person who's making that request. So, yes, I, it would be sad if Into the Music did come to an end because I had to devote myself to a you know job that just didn't allow the time that it takes to continue to create more episodes. It can coast for a while if it needs to because of the size of the library, but I think as with anything, uh, you know, you have to have some fresh blood, some fresh air. There has to be forward movement for the show to really continue to thrive. And that's how it is kind of with my interview series, you know. It's like I've done so many interviews with so many different celebrities, but I think I got enough to also to, to run it for a little while, too, just like you do. I don't nearly have as much as you got for content, but uh, I have over, I think I said last time I checked, about 40, almost 48 hours of, uh, of content so far with interviews. So so that's uh, that's, that's two days' worth of, uh, of content when you really think about it. But, uh, but I, too, want to do more with this, and I want to... You know, I want to personally thank you, Al, for letting me do this interview with you. This has been a, a real treat, and uh, I hope people go check you out uh, into the music dot com and go. Uh, you know, if you have some money to donate, uh, I mean, this ain't you know, this ain't like asking just like for you know, like please, 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 please help. No, this is just if you feel that uh, this is a, a program that you want to support. Uh, we can treat it like a PBS station, you know, like when uh, public, Prairie Public Television always has those uh, crazy donations uh, at the at the wrong period of time or whatever. Well, at least with you, you know, you you have uh, access to uh, let this run for as long as it needs to, pretty much. And uh, on one of our categories, I think it's the hundred dollar level. If you want me to, I'll do the outgoing message on your phone. You know, so it could be <laughs> kind of fun. You don't have to do that, but if you want me to, I'll you know, say, uh, "Hi, this is uh, Al Neff, host of Into the Music. You've reached uh, Frankie Sloss, and uh, please leave your message. And uh, now it's time to get into the message." <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That was something great like word. that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Al. But, uh, you know, the, the idea is just support the program in terms of listen to it. Share it with your friends. If you know of a radio station that might be supportive to uh, having that on the air, let me know about it. It's available in a one-hour weekly format or a two-hour weekly format. And now, soon, a one-hour per night uh, format. So there's lots of different options for the station to get it to more people. Awesome. 
Well, thank you very much, Al, and uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, out of your busy schedule to uh, let me do this interview with you and uh, uh, share it here with the listeners here on KTAC and then, of course, on my YouTube page as well. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Frankie, and I really, you know, I noticed what you do on Facebook. Uh, by the way, Into the Music has a Facebook fan page, so uh, if people want to know a little bit more, we do, I think, mean, really great uh, previews of each week's show, really cool photo collages. Uh, I have a guy working on that that's really quite talented, and then, you know, the latest news. But uh, I see what you do on Facebook to promote your show, and you are very dedicated. You're a hard-working guy, and it's nice to see that from, uh, you know, what I would call a young person uh, to see someone that's that excited about radio in 2014. Hey, I'm old school. You know, I grew up uh, loving, like, the artists of, like, Buddy Holly and Del Shannon and Roar Arms, and I'm only 30 years old, and I'm, uh, I'm as old school as they get. I believe uh, <laughs> radio is you know, should be a show, not a shift, because you know, a lot of DJs just do a shift, and they have no charisma, and they have no love for it like they should, and I believe that radio should be always a show, not a shift. So that's why I do what I that's do. That's right. <laughs> but thank you very much. And don't much, drink Al. on the air, okay? Yeah, don't drink on the air. <laughs> All right, well, thank <laughs> you very much, Al. Appreciate it. No problem.